friends, it is indeed a great honor and pleasure to be a part of this ANZ AWR conference organized between India, Australia, and New Zealand. My today's talk is on why do MIS invinyl hernia repairs fail? And if we look at the causes included in this talk, some of them are absolutely no-brainers because we've been hearing them all along. Some of them we know them sort of, and some of the causes we do know, but we don't know whether there is an evidence for it or not. Some of the causes are such that it might prompt us to think that, well, is this really true? And an occasional cause can be absolutely that I can't believe this. Arugye was the first to publish TAPP way back in 1990. And within four years, he published his second paper on recurrences after inguinal hernia repair, which was a multi-center study with 1,500 hernias. And that showed a 2.2% recurrence. So it shows that even in those early days, many researchers, surgeons, including Arigwe, were looking at recurrences and thinking about how to minimize the failures. And not only that, now, apart from those thousands and lakhs of papers, we have a recent paper published from Australia in 2018, which again has looked at a lot of these factors and their conclusion was recurrence can occur at any stage following in hernia surgery. Thinking of factors for failure, we can divide them into patient factors, hernia characteristics, mesh factors, surgical techniques, surgeon factors, institutional factors, and other causes. Patient factors like obesity, diabetes, smoking, collagen disorders, sex, other comorbidities are well known. Obesity, it has been found that BMI more than 30 has a threefold higher risk of hernia recurrence as compared to those with BMI less than 30. Diabetes has an indirect evidence as a cause of failure, and it has been most studied in ventral hernia repairs. Smoking is a known cause of failure, and it has been studied and quoted extensively. And collagen disorder is one of the most extensively studied, and we all know that collagen turnover profile is altered in patients with inguinal and incisional hernia repair, and it has been found that collagen type 3 is decreased as compared to type 4 and hernia patients demonstrated systemically altered collagen metabolism. If we think of hernia factors, the type of whether it is like sliding hernia or a medial or a direct hernia or a size small or large or whether it's recurrent also influences the failure rates. Medial inguinal hernias and a combined hernias which has got a medial portion presents a significantly higher risk for onset of recurrence. A direct inguinal hernia has a significantly higher recurrence rate than an indirect inguinal hernia. And in male patients, the sliding inguinal hernia has a higher recurrence rate than non-sliding hernia. In fact, recurrent hernias have a higher recurrence rate and every recurrence rate increases it further. So if the first recurrence has a 2% rate, the second one has three and third one has 4% recurrence rate. Talking of mesh factors, which can be classified as weight-wise, pore size-wise or even size-wise, it has been a common feeling that lightweight meshes have more recurrence rates and heavy weight meshes, in fact, they shrink and can lead to recurrence as shown here in the picture from Jan Kukleta's paper. And in fact, this lightweight meshes versus heavy weight and medium weight meshes is not supported by literature. All meshes have similar recurrence rate and mesh weight and structure has been extensively studied by Klosterhafen, and in fact, he has we've just heard an excellent talk on this, and maybe we should think of what he has really told us all about that. Mesh size is one of the most important factors, and it's common knowledge that small meshes lead to recurrence. Minimum size recommended is 15 by 10 centimeters, and all guidelines now recommend larger mesh for larger defects. And there are multiple studies, meta-analysis, and all guidelines have certified that if the defect is large, you should use a larger mesh. Slitting of the mesh is a strict no-no and liable, in fact, reported that when they stop slitting, the recurrence rate or failure rates decrease to 0.36%. And all guidelines say now that no mesh should be slit in MIS inguinal repairs. Amongst the surgeon factors are learning curve, volume of surgeries performed, and speed of surgeries. Guidelines say that at least 65 surgeries are necessary to get over the learning curve. Talking about the volume, the surgeon volume of less than 25 cases per year has a significantly higher recurrence rate. 
and speed of surgery is a surprise factor. And here we can see Halstead talking about it, where he says that brilliance and speed must be subordinated to thoroughness and safety. Now, in this last study of Swedish hernia registry, where they studied it, it was found that recurrence of all patients operated in less than 36 minutes was 26% higher than those patients who were operated with an operating time of more than 66 minutes. And these researchers now exhort all hernia surgeons to avoid speed and maintain thoroughness throughout the procedure. Looking at the surgical technique, TAP versus TEP, fixation versus non-fixation, slitting of mesh and missed lipomas, well, TAP and TEP, there is no difference in recurrence rates. Fixation versus non-fixation, against there is no difference in any of the method used except when the size of defect is more than three centimeters and whenever the defect size is more than three centimeters, then it is recommended that some form of fixation should be done. The wind of wind in the sail phenomenon is known where the mesh protrudes to the defect and can be a cause of failure and the contributing factors could be size of the defect if it is large, lightweight mesh and inadequate fixation. Even inversion of the sac, especially of a direct sac, has been cited to prevent not only seroma formation, but the recurrence formation, a recurrence rate also. And there's now a level four recommendation that the fascia transfer cells should be inverted and pre-tied or fixed to the Cooper's ligament so that it will help in reducing the failure rates. Missed lipoma is one of the most important causes because lipomas are found in 20 to 30% of all MI single hernia repairs, and they also have a separate entity as a classification. Now, all MIS repairs should look for and treat lipomas, and in fact, EAES and other guidelines have recommended that we should actively search for spermatic cord lipomas in all hernia repairs, and they should be reduced and sometimes excised if they are disconnected or devascularized. Looking at the mesh spread, wrinkled mesh is a factor for failure and the mesh should be spread as flat as possible without curling up and rolling. And this was a video presented by me in Sages 2020 where I proposed that there is an endopelvic facial sling which holds the cord structures to the peritoneal flap and if this is divided, then it will allow a flat placement of the mesh here you can see that there is an endopelvic facial sling, which is holding the cord structures. That's the endopelvic facial sling. And if it is divided, then the cord structures will fall down. And this will allow a good parietalization of the peritoneum and the cord structures. And this will allow for a flat placement of mesh against the posterior abdominal wall and thereby minimize the recurrence rate. There is another trick that we use that at the time of closure of the flap, we insert a suction and suck out all the carbon dioxide. This gives us a chance to look at the mesh lying flat on the abdominal wall and posterior abdominal wall. We can actually see whether it is curled up or not. This is again a very recent paper of 2020 by the Japanese surgeons where they've shown that if you use a large size of mesh with at least two centimeters on all sides of the myopectineal orifice and also below the Cooper's ligament, this reduces the failure rates and no talk can be ended before we talk about this excellent presentation and paper by Jorge Dice and Edward Felix, where they propose that a critical view of the myopectinal orifice should be established. And they have proposed that there are nine steps to apply, establish the critical view of myopectinal orifices. All these nine steps are well delineated in their paper and their video. There are other factors for failures also, like post-op complications like hematoma. Another surprise factor could be a presence of national and community database. It has been shown that efforts to improve quality at community level in a nationwide Danish hernia database, this database and reviewing the data actually led to 50% reduction in failure rates. And I'm glad that this conference has not one but two talks on database and maintaining a hernia registry. And therefore, we should all now think of the question, not just why do inguinal hernia repairs fail, but replace it with the question, what can we not do or do so that MIS inguinal hernias do not fail? Thank you.